Welcome, everybody. I'm Jared from TechSquare ATL, and uh, welcome to the virtual pitch competition with Startup Exchange. Let me tell you a little bit about TechSquare ATL real quick. Um, well, first of all, thank you for watching, but uh, TechSquare ATL is a membership community located in the heart of Atlanta's tech scene, right in Midtown. And um, it's filled with startups and corporate innovation centers and academic researchers. It actually has the, the most amount of those in uh, the entire Southeast. But what do, we, what do we exist for? We uh, spark connections uh, through social events, storytelling, and shared and a shared collaborative space in Midtown. So events like this one that you're about to watch, this uh, pitch competition with Startup Exchange, which we partner with many different organizations, including startup um, partners. Um, so Startup Exchange has been a partner uh, with TechSquare ATL for a long time, and they've been putting on a lot of great events. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Going to be a while. We have six teams, and I'll let uh, Stevan kind of explain that. Hello, and welcome everyone to the biannual Startup Exchange Pitch Competition. Although we cannot be physically together today, we're excited to host a fantastic event for you. My name is Stevan Shaw, co president of Georgia Tech Startup Exchange, the largest student led entrepreneurial organization at Georgia Tech. We host everything from workshops for startups to networking events with Georgia Tech students and top level Atlanta entrepreneurs. If you wanna learn more about our events or would like to connect with us, please visit www.startup.exchange to learn more. Now today we're excited to host this pitch competition with our partner, TechSquare Atlanta and a wonderful panel of judges. Our first judge is Seth Radman. He has designed and developed and launched over 40 mobile apps and has been featured on the App Store more than 100 times across the world. He's also been included in Apple's App of the Day. He is the founder of Crescendo, an AI-powered interactive music trainer that facilitates focused practices and immediate feedback. This was recently acquired by Ultima Guitar. Our second judge is Blanca Garcia, CEO and co-founder of BCG Connects. She's worked in WeWork Labs and leads Walker's Legacy Prospectus Accelerator. Our third judge is Rahul Saxena. He is a tech entrepreneur and an investor. He is a previous CEO of Digital Health Department, a former principal investor of Serif VC firm, and is the current associate director of Georgia Tech CreateX. Thank you for all the judges for being with us today. We also have six fantastic teams that will be pitching. We have Jim Splat, FastPath, Senza, Revolut Art, Slate, and Traction. For these teams, we have three prizes to give away as well. We have $500 for the first place prize, $250 for the second place prize, and $100 for the People's Choice Award. Now for this award, remember that this is up to the audience, so remember to vote for your favorite team at the end of all of the pitches. Let's go ahead and get started with our first pitch. We are Jim Splat, and we are committed to reducing congestion in order to create a safe and productive workout environment for everyone. My name is Kim. And I'm Brandon. What's the biggest issue or concern in society today? You guessed it, infection. Now, what is the biggest deterrent to physical activity? Time. What's the biggest issue for members of the CRC? That's right, crowds. At peak hours, there can be lines of up to 10 to 15 people for the bench presses and squat racks. And after eight months of market research, we have proven that gym congestion is a huge issue at university and big box commercial gyms. So the question becomes, how can we get more people at gyms while also reducing congestion? GymSplot is a mobile app that makes working out quick and easy while reducing the barrier of time. We provide a reservation system for the bench presses and squat racks. This means no more waiting in long lines. You can instead wait in a virtual queue while you stretch or do other exercises. We also provide projections of gym utilization as well as real-time gym utilization. This allows members to better plan their gym visits around crowds. The next feature is a map of the gym floor. This enables members to quickly locate their desired machines. And finally, we have a feedback system which enables members to leave machine-specific feedback on whatever machine they want in terms of complaints, suggestions, or alerts of broken machines. So, what if members don't have the app? 
There will be iPads, stationed at your gym's most popular machines. People without the app can simply enter their name and click reserve. It's as simple as that. This demo shows an example of how the reservation system works. Quickly find your desired machine, click reserve, and choose your reservation time. It's that simple. Here we show a map of the gym floor. The map will be accurate to your gym. It is zoomable, scrollable, and clickable. You can leave location-specific feedback to management by simply clicking on the machine, typing your comment, and pressing submit. We have computer vision technology that allows us to keep a running count of occupancy. Our computer vision works by having overhead cameras triangulating on people on the gym floor. This will allow gyms to keep account of their gym floor utilization in real time and cap off occupancy to prevent crowds. Our target customer is gym managers. Gym members, on the other hand, will get the app for free, but can pay a subscription fee for premium services like personalized workouts and exercise tips. What's in it for the gym managers? Higher utilization, less congestion, better understanding of member activity, faster detection of broken machines, and seamless integration. The gym will now be much more productive. Here's how we stack up against the competition. It's a no-brainer. Every industry is becoming automated. It is only a matter of time before the fitness industry follows suit. We plan on expanding our computer vision technology in order to determine machine availability. We will then give members personalized workouts and efficiently guide them throughout the gym floor. If a machine is occupied, we will then give the user alternative exercises and display their locations on the map. All right, awesome pitch. Now, as you can probably tell, those videos were pre-recorded um, just because of this virtual uh, competition, but the feedback from the judges and the uh, Q&A with those, uh, the team members are live. So let's go ahead and go over, um, we'll go with Seth first, then Raul, and then Blanca. Go ahead and um, ask any questions, give any feedback, and uh, then we'll go on with the next pitch after that. Oh, go ahead and unmute yourself there, Seth. There we go. <laughs> I promise I've built tech products before. First of all, great pitch, guys. Really enjoyed that. Given the times right now, I think this will be really helpful when things return to normal because everyone is going to be really concerned and paranoid about germs, especially, and this will provide a really great alternative to that. Um, I'm going to keep myself to one question now. I want to hear about the kind of integration that will, be, that will be required from facilities like Georgia Tech. Let's say Georgia Tech wants to implement, implement this in their CRC. What kind of expenses and integration will be required from their end to install cameras or how do you integrate with existing systems? What kind of effort would a gym need to go through in order to be able to use your software? And then Brandon, go ahead and unmute yourself as well. Okay. There you go. So yeah, so we're actually working on getting implemented in the CRC right now. and we met with the CRC this morning, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to like put iPads stationed near like the most popular machines. So at the CRC, the bench presses and squat racks, and also like in terms of the computer vision aspect, we would all you would need really is like a one camera on the like a bird's eye view camera of the gym floor, and then we from that we can like judge utilization rates and different like um, machine usage rates as well. And in terms of the the cost. Uh, most gyms right now do have like cameras on their gym floor at the CRC. They don't. So that is like something we're working on is like getting the camera set up in the CRC. All right, Seth. Uh, okay. Awesome. Uh, yep. There we go. Is there any other questions, Seth? Um, I have one other question. Um, you know, I think it's a little uncertain how long it'll be until things are returning to normal. And a lot of people are shifting to, you know, first of all, a lot of gyms are closed and a lot of people are shifting to alternate in-home workout routines. Do you see any way that you can provide value to people over the next couple months? Hopefully it's not much longer than that while people are stuck at home. I know that the primary application of this is for in gyms. I'm curious if you've thought about any application that this might have, if this lasts longer than we might expect. Yeah. Um, I've thought about that, but I think we want to like kind of stay focused on the gym in general. And there's like a, there's like, it seems like there's another app every day 
when it comes to like at home workouts. So that's like a really saturated market. And we have, have like a niche in that, like there's no really apps at all. Like right now that like focus on um, the gym floor and reducing congestion and provide like a map of the gym floor and make the whole workout environment more productive for everyone. So that's like our focus. And now we're not trying to uh, expand to home workouts at the moment. All right. Well, let's go ahead and head over to uh, Blanca. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in knowing kind of where you see the value for the customer that you've identified. I know that you talked a little bit about it being uh, the gym managers, uh, but it's, it's, it sounds like one of the, the problems that you're solving are specifically to congestion, um, uh, so time and then the infection piece. Are those, do you feel that right now the way you've positioned your product um, does address uh, those gym managers specific concerns um yeah just want to get yeah. inside in terms of customer mm -hmm. so we were working on this problem before everything happened with the coronavirus and like our whole goal was to like reduce congestion and we were trying to like solve the difficult issue of reducing congestion at the gym while at the same time bringing more gym members in because that's how like the gym managers make revenue and like make profit and so um yeah so i think our system definitely does play into that and we kind of like pivoted our stance a little bit with the coronavirus because like now we've spoken with different gyms. We've talked to Gold's Gym recently and like every gym that's like about to like reopen, they're all like trying to strategize like the best way to go about that. Like how are they going to like motivate people to come back in after in the aftermath of the, the coronavirus. And so like there's like um, in Asia right now, they're doing like uh, waves of people like coming in and like 50 at 50 people at a time and then like like sanitizing between waves so i think our system like really like helps them like expedite that process and like helps them like um lets them know like the areas of most congestion and like allows them to like keep track of like utilization better okay, okay. Yeah. thank you yeah mm -hmm. great job thank you all right well let's go ahead and head over to uh raul yeah um great presentation guys what do you think who's your closest competitor and what do you think the biggest uh value proposition you have over them is okay so um there's a company called net pulse right now and they have like the largest market share in gym apps right now they they do planet fitness and um gold's gym so that i'd say that's probably like our biggest competitor there are other like apps that do more similar to us but like, this is like the most relevant and basically all they do is like they do like class reservations and um, they allow you to like scan in on the app and refer friends and stuff like that so none of their like core functions really have anything to do with congestion and making the gym environment more productive but there are some apps like there's a startup company called city life that um, they have a map of the gym floor where they like use sensors to determine machine availability for like uh, treadmills so that's another like somewhat similar and there's also another like startup company called waitlist me and they like they've talked about like expanding to the gym but they just basically have like a built out waitlist mechanism that they haven't yet like implemented on any gym at any gym yet so we're, we're pretty like unique in our product offering but i'd say net pulse is like our biggest competition right now it's your feature set that you think will give the biggest advantage do you, do you know how much those um net pulse goes for how much is paid for at this time? I'm not sure. I don't know that right now. I need to look that up. Good. All right. Okay. Well, um, great feedback. Great Q&A. Um, there is a, a question from YouTube. By the way, if you are watching this live, if you watching it either on startup.exchange or TechScore ATL, you can get to the actual YouTube page and you can ask questions live. I do want to remind everybody at the end of this pitch, there will be a vote on startup.exchange. It's www.startup.exchange to where you can vote for the, uh, was it popularity? popularity. They'll, they'll get a prize if you vote for them. So um, this question here is, um, this question is from John. So using computer vision, how do you protect the privacy of customers and users of the gym? Uh, do people like being videotaped while exercising? They're just curious, is what they said. So let me get back over to you here. Do 
yeah so do you do you think that people are um you know do they they like being videotaped or is there concerns for privacy there <laughs> brandon can you hear me test test yep okay oh you can hear me now everybody yes oh okay yes. sorry i think i think i i think you all can hear me but the live stream could um so i'll ask the question again for you brandon um this is from john from youtube how do you protect the privacy of customers and users of the gym do people like being videotaped while exercising he's curious okay yeah that's a good question um so there won't be any like live feed of the gym floor of any sort so there won't be any like uh, identification or facial recognition of any kind people will be tracked as objects and so there'll be like a box around them and they'll be tracked around the gym floor but privacy won't be an issue because there's no live feed and there's no facial recognition all right well with that um, we'll go on to pitch number two thank you so much and uh, let's keep it going here hi my name is Prue Martin and on behalf of my other teammates Bram Charles and Pranay Agrawal, I will be pitching FastPath. So we were interested in the problems of shopping in large retail stores. This is a word map based on the responses from our survey, where respondents were asked to describe their experience while shopping. And we found that people see retail shopping as convenient, cheap, but extremely overwhelming. Um, the hundreds of items in the maze-like aisles cause shopping to be time consuming, stressful, frustrating, cumbersome, and unpleasant. And we feel like the retail shopping experience is outdated and broken. Our solution is FastPath. FastPath is an in-store navigation tool that allows users to input their list of items and then creates the most efficient path through the store. It gets the customer in and out as fast as possible. But FastPath can also benefit businesses. For decades, retail stores have been designed to be confusing. But in 2020, we feel like this model is no longer the most profitable. Amazon is offering same day delivery on thousands of items and events like the coronavirus are causing people to shop in person less often. Many retail stores have been hit really hard because few people want a stressful shopping experience when they can just simply order the items online. FastPath creates revenue for businesses by allowing them to optimize their store layout through tracking the most popular pathways and gives them the ability to create location-based ads depending on where a customer is in the store. For our market research, we conducted a survey which had about 125 responses, which we then ran through IBM's SPSS software. The software analyzed the data and created three clusters of respondents. The first cluster was comprised almost entirely of men who greatly valued efficiency, um, regardless of age, income, or education. The second cluster was mostly females who value efficiency very little when compared to other variables such as price of items and proximity to the store. Finally, the third cluster was also almost entirely comprised of women and they valued efficiency more so than the men did. They valued um, efficiency in an incredible amount. Um, and from these two clusters, we were able to determine that 77% of, of those people um, were being driven to shop online due to the layout of stores. Additionally, 65% of those people said that an app like FastPath would make shopping more enjoyable and would cause them to shop in person more often. So based on this data, we feel like there's a strong market for a product like FastPath. This is a demonstration on how FastPath's algorithm would work in the background. This is a pathfinding algorithm. Um, and additionally, other technology that is needed to create in-store navigation is already available with BLE beacons or Wi-Fi signal positioning. The main um, established competitor of FastPath would be Maps and Doors. So far, Maps and Doors has begun, begun partnering with convention centers and already has a well-established website and app on the App Store. But they are just now turning their attention to retail and grocery store opportunities. Um, other retailers like Tesco and Lowe's have experimented with navigation tools, but only um, Lowe's has actually implemented anything in their app. So the next steps for uh, FastPath include creating an app as soon as possible so that we can partner with Atlanta retailers to conduct more research. We want to find out 
does fast path actually improve the shopping experience does it help consumers get in and out as fast as possible and does it help bring more customers in stores for businesses um, do business profits improve when they've partnered with fast path and additionally we feel like our team is um, very well positioned going forward um, we're very confident uh, realm is a bme major and Pranay is a CS major. I'm a business major concentrating in finance. So together we feel like we have a very strong, diverse set of skills that can make FastPath a success. Thank you for your time and we will now move forward with any questions. All right, great pitch number two. We'll stick with the same order. Um, and if you have any uh, questions from the audience, be sure to put it in the YouTube chat there. So we'll go ahead and start with Seth again. Great pitch, really love this. I think you guys are right in line with timing. Uh, this couldn't be better position for timing. I'm curious, how will you map out um, store layouts and item locations? Um, so that, can y'all hear me? Okay, um, so that kind of depends on how well we are able to partner with the business. Like if we're able to gain access to the business like inventory systems and see um, their layout of the stores because they know where almost every item is located. Um, we can use their help to see where items are in the store. And then, like I mentioned, BLE beacons use Bluetooth to kind of like navigate track where an object is in the store. So we can see where people are in the store and how close or far they are to certain items. Okay. Awesome. I have uh, one more question around that. Um, so I'd imagine stores, you know, even if you get in with one store, they might have different layouts, different items, a lot of things in different spaces. Have you thought about the infrastructure that would be required for integration? I'm a, I must just be on a roll with integration questions, but have you thought about what would be required from the business from an integration perspective and the kind of return on investment that they would see if they were to spend the money to integrate your product? Yeah, we have thought about like how difficult it would be with different store layouts. That's something we're still trying to figure out. Um, what's the best way to map out all these different stores that like every grocery store is almost laid out differently. Um, we're looking first, maybe at trying some stores like Walmart that have more standardized layouts. So it wouldn't be as costly to map out so many individual stores and would be easier to integrate. Um, as far as an integration, as far as integration goes, um, what we really would want to see is if a business is partnered with FastPath, are people enjoying their shopping experience more like are people more likely to shop in person rather than using say Walmart's like delivery pickup or pickup like right from the store because businesses, retail stores really want customers to come, come in store so they can just kind of browse and see those items. Even if they have a set list just so that they are kind of seeing everything in the store. Um, and so I think for something um, that'd be really successful for us is if we can see that people actually come in store more than they used to after using this app. And that would be a really good indicator for return on investment. Okay, awesome. I, I was uh, really impressed by the algorithm that you had for your Pathfinder and the design looks really nice. So great job. Um, Thank you. That's all I have for now. All right, we'll go with Blanca. Hey there. Um, great job. It sounds like you guys have really thought through some things and um, I'm really interested. Um, I feel like there are a couple of possibilities for the customer that you could engage and like what what impact you could have with your application so i'm curious to know why um you went with the sort of user that you've chosen and it sounds like it, it would be the actual customers that would be utilizing the app in the store is that correct yes so um but it sounds like what you what you're helping them with is really kind of sort of like navigating the store more effectively so i'm wondering why um, you chose uh, your product to focus on um, the uh, uh, customers that are coming into the store, utilizing it versus perhaps offering that, um, offering some sort of technology to help the layout of those businesses um, so that maybe they're, they're more effectively laying out the, the store so that the customers have that experience. I mean, yeah, just curious to see what your thinking is around that. Um, that was something we really debated early on too, of like, do we create an app that's focused more to the consumer or some kind of tool for businesses so that they can like optimize the layout of their stores and provide like certain ads based on those popular pathways. Um, 
right now, I th- like we think we can go either way just because the more people you have using the app, the businesses would be able to see those popular pathways and make adjustments accordingly. And that's kind of where they get a lot of um, value from using or partnering with FastPath. Um, I think we ultimately decided to go a little bit more consumer based because we felt like there was more opportunities to kind of grow in that way. If we think there it'd be really interesting to partner with like recipe companies and people can input certain recipes and have them automatically loaded into their list or based off their list. Um, we can recommend certain items and saying like, Hey, you've put these five items in your list. Here's a recipe that goes along with, along with this or other items that are very similar. Um, so we felt like there was more opportunity to kind of expand from just the most efficient path of getting in and out. Great. Um, I'm super curious uh, as well in terms of like the nuance of inventory. Um, so uh, how you guys have thought about the effectiveness of, so once they, once your uh, customers are getting to uh, the end of the path, uh, um, pathway that you're writing out for them, if they're getting to the actual products that they want and how you thought about that. Um, so when designing for like our thought process to design the app, um, we would have, um, each item would, um, you input it. And then like, once you arrive to it, maybe like either check it off the list or so it knows that like, it knows you're near this item and you've arrived at it, but just so it knows that you've like picked up the item and put it in your cart if you want to buy it. And then it can adjust the, the most of path, like the path accordingly. Um, so that was kind of our idea of going forward, tracking where someone is in the store and how far they've gone through this list of um, items. And then once they've reached the end, they can either close the app or just look, I'm done with my shopping. And it would know that um, this path is done. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Great job, guys. Thank you. We'll continue with our third judge, Raul. Yeah, um, great presentation too. Um, do people have to enter in all the inventory in their shopping list beforehand to get that path to go into it? Or is it, is it just for the one-off items when consumers are going to it? Um, either or, it's really up to the consumer. For something like retail shopping in like Target or Walmart, when you're really only shopping maybe for like two or three items, but you don't know where they are in such a large store, um, we think it'd be really useful if you're just inputting one or two things and then just taking you straight to that item. Um, but for like something like grocery stop, grocery shopping, if you have a bunch of recipes or items that you want to pick up for the whole week, um, inputting those or adjusting those as needed while you're shopping. So if you are in the process of shopping and realize, Oh, I need this item. You'd be able to just input in that item and the most efficient path would adjust accordingly based on your input of this new, I guess, product. Is it tracking you in, in the process or is it just assuming you're starting off at the door of the grocery store? We want to, event, if we partner with businesses to implement those BLE beacons, which can utilize Bluetooth to see where people are in the stores. Um, without those kind of beacons or Wi-Fi positioning technology, that I would just have to assume that you are at where your last item was. And then when you click confirm that you picked up the next item, it would adjust your location accordingly. But without those beacons, it'd be pretty hard to, na- like, it would be impossible for the app to update automatically of where you are in the store. Usually there are certain things that are always there, like the fresh produce and stuff, right when you enter in consistent mm-hmm. stores, but then you would have to come there and might say, well, I need to know where something is to go from there to there rather than end up going back to the front door, right? Right. All right. Uh, any last questions there, Raul? Nope. All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, the, we did have some questions from uh, the YouTube audience, and we'll, we'll share those with the teams after. Uh, but for time, we're going to go ahead and s- skip over to our next pitch and keep things moving. And here is our third pitch. Last month, I spent so many hours trying to remove unwanted hair from my body. And this is true for so many individuals around the world. Hair removal is a daily routine. But now, imagine a future where there's no more shaving or painful waxing. I would like to introduce you to Sinza, a permanent hair removal solution for everyone. We bring our technology to laser hair removal facilities for instant hair removal results. 
Apparently, laser hair removal has many limitations. The most critical limitation is its lack of versatility, where it has no effect on dark skin tones or light hair anatomies. On top of this, treatment is expensive, ranging from $75 all the way up to $500 per session. Not to mention, on average, at least six or more sessions are required to see some form of hair reduction. In addition, these procedures are often painful for individuals. But with Sinza, we offer a solution for everyone. We bring our consumers a one-time treatment, even for light hair and dark skin tones. With this, we can save them time and money. Of course, laser hair removal facilities are our go-to. Our overall goal for them is to increase their customer satisfaction. We learned through customer discovery that the key client pain point is to come to these sessions over and over again. By providing one-time treatment option for these facilities, we can increase their customer satisfaction and clientele in return. All at the same time, we'll save them time and money too. Now, Senza is a UV absorption lotion. This lotion is applied to the client before laser treatment. Once applied, the lotion has the capability to absorb the UV energy from the laser to permanently destroy the hair follicle, even for follicles without hair protruding through the skin. Now the market is huge. The hair removal treatment on a global scale market is $3.4 billion. If we zone into laser hair removal specifically in the US, this takes up over $410 million and is only projected to increase. If you're wondering how we make money, we already know that there are over 1 million hair removal, laser hair removal procedures performed each year. But through customer discovery with the Senza product, we can increase this population to over 3.5 million. If we charge $200 per treatment and take a 50% profit, we're looking at over $350 million in revenue per of course, we have to look at competition. Competition is pretty scarce in this area because of the lack of innovation. Most hair removal is non-permanent, including threading, tweezing, sh and shaving. We do have more permanent options like electrolysis and at-home lasers. However, these require multiple sessions and are often quite painful. This makes Sinza a paradigm to the hair removal market. Now, what we need to get there, we need funding for our initial concept prototyping stage. In addition, we need to be connected with key industry leaders like dermatologists and laser hair removal facilities to create, to create these partnerships. If you know any engineers or bio, biochemists interested in this area, please send them our way. Why should you invest in us? My name is Sarah Van Cocker and I have a teammate, John Stefan Kwam. We have a proven entrepreneurship background and we have expertise in healthcare affairs. We really believe we can take this product all the way to market. And with that, I would like to open it up to the questions. Thank you very much for your time. All right, great pitch again. Um, so that's our third pitch, we're halfway through. I do wanna remind everybody at the end of the sixth pitch, that's three more, uh, we're going to open up open up to public voting or audience voting, so uh, People's Choice Awards. So this is where you'll go, startup.exchange. It'll all be there. Um, the live stream's on there as well, so you can continue to watch the live stream as we're going. And if you want to vote for your favorite uh, pitch, it'll be there right away. So let's go ahead and go to the judges in same order as last time. We'll start with Seth. Hey, Sarah. Great pitch. Um, really love the product concept. I've worked in the medical space a bit, and I know this is a big pain for a lot of people. So I think you're you'd be really helping a lot of people. I'm curious: Have you done any testing to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of the product? You have some really strong numbers and results. What kind of testing have you done? Um, no. So unfortunately, we have not done any testing yet. Um, we've only done customer discovery to really validate the feasibility of this product. Um, so I believe with funding, we can definitely start get uh, start moving forward with some testing to really test that effectiveness. Okay, no problem. Um, another question, you mentioned that it'll be available at um, laser hair removal facilities. Tell me about your decision to, to have a distribution model at those facilities as opposed to letting someone purchase this on its home, on, on their own. To, to make sure I'm understanding correctly, does this only work in conjunction with laser hair removal facilities or is it something I can do on my own separately? 
Of course. Uh, so our go-to market strategy is to partner with laser hair removal facilities because we want them to really market the product for us. Um, with them having our product, it really enhances everything for their business altogether because they can bring in a lot more customers. However, we are always thinking about growth and it would really be ideal to really take this technology to the home, especially with lasers on the market like Amazon currently. If we can match our product with those specs, um, I think that would be great for our customers for the future. Okay, awesome. Great job. Blanc, over to you. Yeah, you guys did a great job. Um, your presentation is really powerful, and I think it's really clear that you're solving an important problem. Um, the yeah, I guess I, I kind of kind of think back on Seth. Like, we really feel it's important that you figure out a way to test it so that you can also demonstrate that it's effective because all of this is sort of dependent on on the effectiveness of your product. And I'm wondering, is there what what would be sort of like the initial um, way to do that? What would be sort of like the smaller way to test it? Do you have a plan for that? Um, yes, so I've actually spoke to some health, uh, some healthcare workers in the field with chemistry, um, and they said basically you would set up some samples. Uh, or how I see it going is we create our lotion treatment, um, we get laser hair removals, and then from there we uh, treat it with certain energies. And if that energy completely destroys the follicle, then we can understand, hey, it will damage it. But then from there, we'll have to go into actual effects to skins. So it will be a progressive testing stage first to, you know, figure out the concept and then from there test the biological effects to our customers. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, sure. And I'm, I guess I'm interested. It sounds like, um, based on the science so that you, you all have figured out, it does have to do with laser. So matching it with laser hair removal, but it could work with other type of hair removal, um, methodologies. And do you think that maybe via some testing you might discover? Uh, yeah, I'm just curious in, in, in why you made the decision, uh, in terms of partnering specifically with laser hair removal. Is it is it because based on the science of your product that laser hair removal would match best with um, with the lotion? So actually, the market for permanent hair removal is dominated by laser. So for permanent hair removal results, I really want to get into the biggest market first to really grow our device. So that's why I chose laser. Um, I believe we could have done something with electrolysis, another form of permanent hair removal, but just because of popularity, I really wanted to go with laser because bigger market. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much. Good job. Thank you. Yeah, really interesting. Really interesting presentation. Um, uh, is the is your initial customer the laser hair removal centers? Then that they would stock the product and use it as part of the application. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, sir. So the idea is we would uh, have a direct sales team going to these laser hair removal facilities and tell them about our product. It's all about education in this field. Um, and then from them, understanding that they can get their customers done with one form of treatment and also upcharge treatment because of that one time, they can really market our product and market themselves even better um, and really set themselves apart from other laser hair removal facilities if they have this one-time session treatment. Because again, going to sessions every month, it's time consuming. And as we know, time is very valuable for us today. So. And that value proposition, can you just quickly go through that? So you'll reduce the number of times they go to the center. For the centers, are they looking for reasons to reduce that number or is the upsell that they can do outweigh the, the returning, you know, visits for follow-up treatment if, if i was if i was a financially driven um center of course great question and we had to really think this one through because if we down the number of sessions you would the number the amount of money they're bringing in might go down however our customers are definitely willing to spend a lot more money with this one-time treatment even up to the treatments with eight sessions however the goal for Senza is to make permanent hair removal uh, more, accessible, more accessible to everyone. So 
we believe, and after again, through customer discovery, we can do one session at a higher charge per treatment session. If you compare it to the multiple sessions of laser hair removal um, at a reduced overall cost. I think that was a little confusing. So please ask me again and I can restate it. That. <laughs> no, I think I understand. Okay, so, perfect. A more valuable solution or more <laughs> question, I should say. So um, that was my primary question. Thank you. Of course. All right, moving right along. Um, we had some questions. Uh, let me check the time here real quick. We're gonna keep it moving along. Um, again, we'll send the questions to the, um, the different teams after. Um, but we'll go ahead and start. Uh, we'll we'll go with pitch number four here, and we have Revolut Art. Hello and welcome to Revolut Art. I'm Mahmoud Maparo, CEO and co-founder. And today we're going to start off by introducing our problem, so we can give you a greater context on what we're trying to accomplish through our product. The problem we're trying to solve can be the, can be explained in three statements. Being discovered is a growing issue for a lot of artists due to oversaturated content on so many social media sites. There's an increasing divide between galleries and artists. Um, access to grant finance is one of the biggest challenges galleries felt that their companies would face in the upcoming years. So here's our solution to these problems. A social platform where different members of the art world can discover new and unique pieces, collaborate through Rev Studio Tool, or develop their professional network, which can lead to future opportunities. So here's our market validation side. As you can see, 100% of the artists use a social media platform such as Instagram to promote their artwork. But 71% believe that these platforms did not really promote collaboration and they didn't really advance their careers. 68% of the galleries surveyed agree that it's become progressively difficult to find a new and emerging artists within their local spaces. Here's our market size. More than $16 billion in sales have been reached by art fairs in 2019. More than $20 billion have been spent by galleries and patrons on a range of external support services. More than $4 billion have been spent by galleries in exhibiting and attending. After explaining our problem solution, we can actually get into the product. For your information, the product has is available on the Google and Play Store for you guys to interact with it. So the first key component of Revolut Art is discovery. The ability for anyone from the art world to come on this platform and discover new and unique pieces of art, as well as develop new connections with artists, curators, or patrons. The second key component of Revolut Art is collaboration and communication. Anyone on the platform can create an online workplace, which we're calling a studio. So the studio allows people to exchange ideas, art, pictures. As we, as we continually make progress, we're going to keep updating the, our collaboration and communication tools because we see a lot of prospect in these type of tools and the possibilities of what artists, curators, and patrons can, can create with these tools are endless. When, uh, when artists, curators, and when artists, curators, and patrons collaborate and create exhibitions, galleries, or uh, fairs, a financial transaction always occurs. Revolut Art will take a 5% commission on these transactions. So another question you might be asking is, how can we enter such an exclusive industry? To do this, we're going to first host art competitions to get an initial user base of artists. This the second thing we're going to do is partner up with art galleries. We're in, currently in talks with Kylan Gallery. It's a gallery based in Atlanta that handles a lot of contemporary and new wave art. Uh, the third thing, the third thing we're going to do is partner up with art influencers. These are people who are in the art world but have a large social media following. So the competition. The diagram over here illustrates how we differ from our competitors, such as. Instagram, Dayflash, Behance, ArtStation, as you're providing them with an online workplace, content that is mainly focused on art. And by fo focusing on these two things, we can create a new and unique experience for the users, um, which is an experience that people from the art world have been looking for. Here's our competitive advantage. We're first to market, easy to use. So we are looking for a seed on to reach 10,000 users at the end of our beta phase. If you're interested or have any more questions, you can contact me at Mahmoud at revolutart.com. Thank you. I hope I have your vote. All right. Can somebody put the, 
that contact email in the in the chat on YouTube. Reminder, we are on YouTube. You can ask uh, questions in the YouTube chat if we have time after the judges have provided their feedback. Another reminder, we will open up the voting on startup.exchange, which is right there, um, to vote for your People's Choice Award. Um, so again, here we go. Let's go ahead and to the judges and we'll go with Seth. I am having a great presentation. Really love that. I can tell you're passionate about art and everything. Um, you mentioned that collaboration is one of your key differentiators, right? There's a lot of platforms mm -hmm. that have a lot of art. I didn't really hear a lot about that. Um, could you tell me more specifically what tools you have on your platform that enable artists to collaborate with each other? So it's essentially we provide them um, visibility to um, to uh, it's like an online workplace where they can exchange messages, uh, pictures as well as we handle a lot of the, the legality issues of um, creating contracts between the curator and the artist. For example, if the artist, um, for example, if the patron needs uh, to organize an event, they can con they can contact the curator and the financial, we can handle the financial transactions as well as, well as providing them with a the contract. So they can organize events. And especially with what's happening right now with Corona, I think uh, online workplaces, how things will be shifted. And so people can create um, uh, like online, like create an online workplace so they can communicate online. Okay, very cool. So it's kind of like a Instagram or LinkedIn-ish, but for art. I have a, another question. So I'd imagine one of the few ways that you could prevent other people from doing this is by growing a large user base very quickly, which mm -hmm. is usually one of the most, uh, the biggest signs of value in a marketplace. You mentioned some partnerships that you have. Um, I expect it would probably take, you know, a high level of growth to be able to be defensible so that if someone else sees you doing this, they wouldn't do mm -hmm. it. Can you tell me kind of about a go-to-market strategy about how you plan on getting a lot of users really quickly onto your platform? Yeah, so actually we we recently launched and we have some users coming in. Um, but, but this was just testing, to, so it was just among my network to see the artists that are, what their feedback is. But as soon as we properly launch and start distributing and giving at, um, putting it out there. Um, the idea would be to host this art competition. The art competition would have like a cash prize or a prize that would give an incentive to people to start posting. Uh, the other um, thing is we're planning to, we actually, we have a gallery involved on our platform right now. Um, the gallery is getting their network of artists on our platform. And so this is, these, these artists already have an established um, following. So getting these users, getting these artists will allow us to get more users onto our platform, as well as we're partnering up with art magazines at Emory at Georgia Tech. And these art magazines have um, a lot of artists involved because these magazines um, have a, already have a network. So once we get these magazines, the, um, the artists in their network also come on their platform. Okay, awesome, thank you. Hi, great Hi. presentation. Um, I loved it. Mm -hmm. It was very beautiful visually, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm interested in knowing um, a little bit about why you chose the platform that you're building uh, based on your customer discovery. So I did hear sort of the uh, problems that you're describing in terms of the creative and the art world. Uh, but I guess I have questions about um, how people are getting on the platform. Um, one, because uh, one of the biggest issues with some of the environment you described is sort of the exclusivity and because it's really hard to distinguish i guess good art so how are you how are you if you are um, supporting or facilitating that via uh, your platform and then i'm um, just wondering overall about the choice of creating a, co a collaboration you know linkedin for artists so to speak um platform if i'm if i'm comparing it correctly mm -hmm. just give me some insight into that um, well, the kind of the main reason I created this is uh, it's like a personal story because my sister is an artist, and so she so I've seen her struggle as an artist. She it took a long time for her artwork to get into exhibitions and museums, and so the first museum that she was contacted by was in Warsaw, Poland, and by the time they contacted her, we had um, we had to move to America, and so we couldn't she couldn't really see her artwork being displayed in Warsaw. And it made me realize a lot of artists have the struggle of developing the professional network. 
And so we want to provide them with this platform. And so I start talking to other artists and seeing if they have the same problem, especially like emerging artists. And it seems like that's a growing problem for a lot of artists. And the reason we chose to focus on collaboration is because for art to truly remain strong and be a creative force in the world, collaboration is one of the key things. With um, If you get a lot of people working on one thing, you can create an amazing experience for a lot of people rather than one person working on it. So by allowing a lot of people, and we've seen, especially with a lot of big artists like Tenkashi Murakami, he has like 50 assistants working on one painting for him. And so I, I think in the art world, collaboration is one of the biggest things. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. And I'm, I'm interested in knowing, so kind of my earlier question, which is, Mm -hmm. Does your platform intend to um, support into the curation piece of uh, of that communication of finding that talent? So, for what what I mean by that is, as an art um, a gallery, uh, you know, director, if I go on your platform, can I kind of mm -hmm. assume that if I'm looking for artists in Atlanta, that the kind of artists that I'm going to be running into have kind of been vetted to some extent, or is that really not something you're thinking about yeah um yeah definitely like um i mean the thing is we don't want to be another instagram where it becomes oversaturated with so many different artists we want to create good content and that's why um one of the things we're implementing right now especially since i've launched the app uh, the app and there have been a lot of users but not a lot of users are actual artists so what we're doing right now to separate them is creating sh um, a section called showcased artists so I guess putting more importance on these um, artists that are actually putting their work out there and have um, are and have good quality in them, if I'm if I'm saying that correctly, but um, kind of the blue tick mark, uh, like you see on LinkedIn or Instagram, that these are um, these are established people, these are established artists, and I guess to divide all of them, like for example, if you're looking for an artist in Atlanta, we have different sections enabled. Um, dedicate towards different users and right now we've talked to a lot of artists but we have, we're also talking to a lot more curators and so phase one of the app was to make it dedicate towards user artists because once we get artists on the platform we can start making the app more catered towards curators as well so right now we wanted artists on the platform and then once we have artists curators will start to join and once we have curators we can start catering the app a bit to what curators want as well. Okay. All right, we're gonna keep moving. Um, we are running behind now, so we'll go to Raul, and then um, you know, just one question. If you can keep it to one question, and then uh, we'll continue with the pitches. Sounds good. Is there? How do your artists measure success on your platform? So, um, um, what do they? What do they? Once they put their art on, how do they know? What, what's their feedback to say that you know? Um, to keep putting more art on there um definitely one of the things we're doing is a like counter a following counter so they can see how many likes they're getting how much following they're getting but as well as um showing them how many people have viewed their profile um in the last 24 hours as well as our trending section is right now very popular um for example on the app there's a trending section so it, if, if they have a lot of likes, their artwork can easily go in the trending section. And that's one of the key uh, K KPIs for these artists to see their success. And I know I only have one question, one quick one. Are you watermarking the pictures too, as they post it? Um, for the artists or for us? Or for you on the platform for the painting? Um, so what we're doing uh, right now, like our next update we're doing is so they, if they want to share it on Instagram an image they see, it's um, there's a watermark on their on the image they share that has Revolut art on it. Okay, thank you. Great. Perfect. And that was the question from the uh, YouTube audience. So uh, thanks again. Uh, we're going to continue on with the next right. pitch. We'll keep it going. And uh, remember, uh, we'll we'll be opening opening voting in two more pitches. <laughs> Right now, off the top of your head, think about how many pieces of paper exist in your home. I mean paper you've printed on and don't need anymore, scrap paper, and each and every notebook. Would you even be able to come up with a ballpark number? I know I wouldn't. 
Well, whatever number you came up with, multiply it by every household in America and you'd have close to a trillion sheets. Now, let's pivot to recycling, something I'm sure we've all done because we're well aware of the environmental benefits. Well, what recycling companies don't want you to know is that recycling isn't all that eco-friendly. What they profit off of is your eagerness to be environmentally friendly. My name is Kyandra Peart. I'm the CEO and founder of Slate, a company that is about to disrupt a $6.6 billion industry. And this is exactly how. Slate is revolutionizing Going Green by creating the Slate Reverse Printer. This device would take any piece of paper that has been written on or printed on and instantaneously remove the ink, virtually cleaning it in order to give you a fresh, clean sheet of paper ready for immediate use. The Slate Reverse Printer will begin similar to an office-sized large copy and printing machine. It can be placed in any and every office building. As quickly as you can print what you need, you can unprint when you're done and do this as many times as you need. Companies spend upwards of $8 billion a year on paper for their employees. If every single employee reused their piece of paper only one time, Slate would be able to cut that number in half, saving $4 billion. This is in addition to the positive impact that Slate will have on the environment. One of the reasons for deforestation in the Amazon is due to the need of trees to create paper products. Slate will reduce the need for new paper and in turn reduce the amount of trees needed to cut down. To add on, Slate will reduce the massive amount of paper that needs to be recycled. The recycling industry yearly wastes about 2.142 billion gallons of water and $3.875 million on employees working at the mill. And all of this is being done to barely make a dent in carbon emissions. Back in seventh grade, yes, when I was only 12 years old, I came up with the idea for Slate after seeing my mom, who works in a DOE as an administrator, come home with tons of paper on a daily basis. Now, as a Georgia Tech student, I'm able to turn my 12-year-old dreams into a reality, but only with your help. Slate is asking for $500 to build the first reverse printer prototype. Think about it. Nothing we have right now could have possibly existed without at least one piece of paper coming into play during its manufacturing. We all know that the world is headed towards a digital age, but paper is the most important invention made to man. Yet no advancements have been made towards it since the printing press in 1440 and the commercial printer in 1938. The next step for the world is the reverse printer. I want everyone to stop and rethink the way that you recycle and let us give your paper a clean slate. Really great pitch. Um, we'll keep it going. Um, off to the judges with Seth. Yeah, uh, really great presentation. Um, when I saw reverse printer, I was like, what? Um, so I, yeah, really cool. I have a few questions. I'm gonna keep it to one short mega question, which is like, how does it work? It sounds like you guys haven't built it yet. So one is just like, how does it work? I'm genuinely curious. And the follow-up that I'm gonna ask to that is, can you, re can you only reuse a single piece of paper once or how many times can you reuse one piece of paper? So okay, so yeah, thank you. So our goal is to be able to use paper as many times as you need it to until like the actual fibers of the paper start breaking apart. And then from that point, you can move on to recycling. So with paper right now, if you use it one time, you need to recycle it in order to be able to reuse it at all. But being able to put it through our reverse printer, use it multiple times before it actually does need to be recycled and turned into a new sheet of paper. So in terms of what ex how exactly the device works, that's what we're conducting research on. So a lot of research actually has been done on this. And since like, because of Corona and everything like that, we're not actually able to conduct research. We've been basically looking at other people's research papers and seeing what works for them and what has not worked. So from there, we've decided that we're gonna go on a chemical based um, route due to the fact that some people have used lasers and it does in fact work with the lasers, but um, their research hasn't progressed in the fact that we think that it's too expensive to put, to actually like um, put into each and every office building. So that's why we've been looking at um, a chemical route and that's where we're going to start conducting our research on. Okay, great. Thank you. I just want to emphasize one more time. I love the pitch. It really got my attention when you said that recycling companies want me to do this out of the goodness of my heart because it makes them money. Uh, Absolutely. So, really great presentation. I think that's all for me. Thank you so much.
Hey there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I, I don't think I can second enough what Seth said. It was really powerful. Um, I love that you integrate your story. Um, it's personal. Um, and I think that's very powerful. Get to the gut. Um, I think I kind of have a similar question in terms of like, how does it work? And I feel like maybe just do a, just my, a comment would be um, uh, do a little work on that piece of it, like whatever you figured out and the direction you're going in, in that, because uh, it was sort of unclear to me, um, like how, how, how would that actually happen? Um, and then I guess I'm just kind of curious, like what, what would be the next step to that? So where, what, what customers are you targeting and kind of what, what are you looking in terms of uh, bringing it to market, even at like that first phase, what would that look like for you guys? Absolutely. So to address the, um, the first part, so basically, um, printers use two different things. Some use ink and some use toner. So we would have to have a different method in order to remove each of them. So for the ink base, ink is based of, um, the, the actual pigment and then the binder. So the pigment is like um, just the coloring or anything else. And then the binder is what holds it together and holds it to the paper. So what we're trying to do is um, determine what chemical would actually eliminate the binder and allow it to actually lift off the paper and separate the ink from itself. And then from then, we're possibly looking into being able to basically sweep off the pigment of the paper and then reuse the pigment as well. So then on a toner base, it's not the same thing. So we would just either have to look at a chemical that's going to serve as um, like a lifter and then maybe a sticky um, device that would like um, physically remove like the letters off of the paper. So our hopes is that our single device would be able to tackle both things, if not determining if it's either toner or ink on the paper and then doing, or maybe the person can like it, like um, insert like what kind of material is used on the paper and then from there remove the ink. I'm sorry, I forgot what the second question was. <laughs> uh, the second question was essentially your go-to-market. What are you guys thinking of in terms of your initial customer? Um, we would be a, um, we, we would be selling our device to companies, not necessarily consumers. Our hope in the long run would be to make it a small enough device that everyone can have a printer and a reverse printer or a single integrated device in their houses. But as for now, we think that the device would one be too big for people to just like have in their house. So it'd be better off if it was in an office building and used for um, the entire floor. All right. Well, let's go ahead and continue with Raul. Oh, hold on. I got you. There you go. Sorry about that. So those are a little bit of my similar questions. Um, you know, the, the problem resonates with me. If you, I don't know if you can see on my thing, half a trillion of those pages are probably on my desk every year. Um, so definitely a, a big fan of what you're doing. Um, what do you think the the specs are for from a pricing standpoint that makes this sense? How much is someone willing to pay for this um, to have an appliance in their home or in their office that that makes uh, uh, let's let's start with home. You know, I know you said you want to start with the office. Maybe it'll be too big, and there are other specs on that. But what do you think you need to get the price point to be to be a compelling solution for people to use? I think that the price point would be the same as a as it would cost to buy a printer now or possibly less. I'm not sure how exactly close to that we would get, but we definitely don't want it to be a big expense as to where people can't, even though it would save you money in the long run, we don't want the initial price to be so big that people don't see the correlations in the future, so how much paper that they would be buying and how much this device would be um, saving them. So we want it to be in the general area of what a printer costs now, but maybe even a little bit higher, but we definitely don't want it to be a huge expense to people. Do you know the technology well enough to know how long the process is? Is it one page at a time and how long it takes to to uh, wipe it wipe it clean? So from like experiments, I guess, like in my house, basically just trying to remove the paper, as I said, with the toner and the sticky surface and like um, acetone is the chemical that I like try to use. It only took a couple of seconds for me to dab the paper and then take the tape and then like lift off the paper, lift the like letters and the toner off of the paper. So I think that a device would become 
as instantaneous as a printer is right now. And that would need its own refillable type of a, a consumable, just like you have you buy ink toner, you would probably have yes. to, to, to yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, once again, Raul, you uh, you kept asking the same questions that was in the YouTube chat, so we'll continue along, <laughs> and uh, we'll go to um, our last and final uh, pitch. But uh, I want to remind you, uh, voting is going to open up right at the end of this. So startup.exchange. So www.startup.exchange to vote for the People's Choice Awards. The judges will deliberate for about 10 minutes and then come back and uh, present the winners of today's virtual pitch competition. So with that, let's go ahead and go to our last pitch. Hello, we are Santiago and Gabriel, and today we are for the first time introducing Traction, the solution for increasing productivity in the workplace. $650 billion. That's how much distracted employees are costing American businesses every single year. That's right, $650 billion. This is clearly a huge problem. So here are some facts that might help us understand it a little bit better. 30% of employee activity on the internet is not work-related. Employees spend over two hours a day checking personal email. And over 55% of employees say that social media at work is a distraction. The average employee is interrupted about 56 times a day about 70% of employees feel disengaged in the work, and an engaged workforce can lead to 202% higher cumulative performance. The global productivity market has shown great signs of opportunity in the past years. In 2018, the global market for business productivity software was $33 billion, and it is expected to reach $93.36 billion by 2025, with the United States holding about 60% of this market. In its essence, workplace productivity is the amount of value produced in a company divided by time and cost. After doing some research, we identified the two main culprits of lack of productivity in businesses as distraction at the individual level and disengagement at the enterprise level. This problem is huge, and despite growing, it's clearly not new. We don't claim to have discovered that the workforce is not achieving its full potential. However, we do believe that we found a novel solution that approaches this problem in a unique way. Before explaining what traction is about, Let's see some of the current attempts at solving this problem. The first type of solution is what we call the Big Brother approach. These are generally enterprise softwares that monitor the activity of employees, giving the employers a detailed breakdown of the ways in which their workers are wasting their time. These solutions collect a lot of highly sensitive data and valuable data just to present them to the employer. This may give the employer a sense of control over the workforce, but this is just an illusion as information without action is worthless for making changes. Moreover, this approach is not only, not only ignores the needs, and wants of the employee, but they're inherently a monumental disruption of privacy. On the other hand, we have what we can call the personal growth category. This includes hundreds, if not thousands, of mobile and desktop applications that help users develop habits, decrease distractions, and motivate them to achieve their goals. These apps are great, and I myself have created one, which you can find on the App Store. However, users can install and delete them at any moment. They have no relation to your work or your coworkers, and they don't give any personalized goal based on your internet usage something you probably don't want either. Traction is the first enterprise productivity solution centered around the employee. Traction is the only solution tackling both distraction at the individual level and disengagement at the enterprise level. In a nutshell, Traction achieves this by creating personalized goals with the use of machine learning and improving engagement among coworkers with weekly productivity leaderboards. The first thing you see when you open Traction is your dashboard. Here, you can get detailed insights into your daily internet usage, task completion, and overall productivity. Traction syncs with all the project management tools you use to keep track of your progress as well as how you're spending your time. But having all this data will be a waste if it's not used to give the employees a call for action. Here's where machine learning comes into play. For the first two weeks, Traction learns your specific app usage, habits, and task completions to create for you personalized, intelligent goals that motivate you to decrease distractions and be more productive. Previously, we saw how Traction deals with distractions, but how do we deal with disengagement? Traction reimagines work engagement by letting you compete with your coworkers and prove that you're the most efficient in the office. Traction features for engagement, incentivize higher productivity by each employee, and at the same time allow management to recognize these individuals who stand out. Some of our engagement features involve challenges, employee recognition and customized rewards, as well as job feedback and surveys. Although Traction benefits an enterprise, it is the employees who are the focus of our attention. From personalization to privacy to positive reinforcement, we believe that what is best for each employee is ultimately what is best for the company. There are many business productivity softwares in the area of project management tools, personal growth, employee engagement, 
and employee monitoring, and each have their pros and cons. Nevertheless, we have noticed that most of these great features in these areas are exclusive to one another. Traction covers this gap, where it is able to integrate the best features and remove those that unnecessarily affect the employee. As part of our business plan, Traction involves a business-to-business -business subscription model. The first plan has a cost of $8 per user per month, and the extensive enterprise plan with customizations has the cost of $19 per user per month. This is our team, and we invite you to join us if you also believe that increasing engagement and decreasing distraction starts with traction. All right, so uh, we'll go to the judges one last time, and right after this, we're going to open up the polling for the People's Choice Awards. Uh, if you have any questions for that pitch, uh, go ahead and put that in the YouTube chat as well. So startup.exchange in a second for the live poll. And here we go. Oh, voting is up actually right now. So you can go right now if you want to vote uh, for your favorite pitch. There you go. If you're on mobile, go ahead and head over there. After you hear the judge's deliberation, they'll deliberate for 10 minutes or so. And then we'll stop the voting um, when the judges come back. So here we go. Um, start off with Seth. First of all, a great pitch. I was very much distracted by your beautiful slide design. Uh, a little ironic, I know. Um, but yeah, really, really well done. This is a huge problem, especially at home. I'd imagine these distractions are higher than ever for people. So people will definitely be going all around this. Um, I think it's interesting the approach going straight to enterprise. I think, you know, that might be a little challenging given that it's a small startup and there's a lot of other players. So I'm curious to hear, you know, obviously Slack is a really big tool that is a workplace tool. Let's say that Slack hears about what you're doing and they really like it. Um, what do you think would prevent them from just copying the features that you have and using it with the existing user base they have since they're a pretty giant company? Yeah, so that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so that's something we definitely thought about. We believe that there are many different competitors um, that sort of approach this problem in a way, and Slack is one of the biggest by far. Um, our approach is not in, really to compete with Slack, but we believe we can deliver many um, many aspects of our software um, is something that Slack doesn't really try to, to solve. We would, however, implement with Slack and with many other apps such as Trello and other goal completions app. So we could serve as a dashboard for all those other um, project management tools that you would use. Okay, that's, that's cool. Um, and the, the, you brought up a good point in Slack. Good that Slack has a lot of integrations. I, I'm curious, like I mentioned before, selling to enterprise can be difficult, especially with a brand that may not be recognizable, definitely doable. Have you thought about how you would approach these larger companies and how would you differentiate yourself and get them to trust you compared to some of the larger brands that they've already done business with? Definitely, yes. So getting to those bigger, larger companies is definitely one of our goals. But we believe the approach to first to be able to make it there, we have to start with smaller businesses. And we believe... We, if we start smaller to medium-sized businesses to bigger businesses, we'll be able to learn in that process and um, adjust our approach so that it would serve big businesses much better. We would also have um, a higher customer base and um, suggestions and feedback from users until we get to that point. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Great job, super engaging, um, uh, exciting technology that y'all are building. I, I guess the question I have around, um, you talked about how your competitors are either, either sort of acting as big brothers or there's sort of like these habit, um, personal growth types of technologies. I'm wondering if you are in the engagement piece of, of your technology, how do you um, how do you mitigate sort of privacy? So I guess, I, I, and just make sure, making sure that I understood, it sounds like there's kind of like a gamifying piece to this where you, people can kind of, um, you know, accomplish things based on their, on their performance and their responsiveness to, to the um, apps, prompts, and goals. But I, yeah, I'm just trying to get some clarity because it, it sounds like um, com the uh, companies would have access to kind of what employees are doing. What does that look like? So yeah, thanks for asking. Privacy is definitely one of our main concerns at Traction. We believe that although, yes, the system needs all that 
um, really detailed data about your internet usage and task completion. That data has, uh, doesn't really have to go um, nowhere. The, the company doesn't have to get specific knowledge of your internet usage and your employer doesn't really need all this detailed data. All this information would remain encrypted. It would remain um, only for you to see with all the metadata, like the your progress in productivity and your decrease in overall distraction consumption, that would go to the the employer or the company. Great. Sounds like you really thought that through. Awesome. Good job. Thank you. Uh, I, I like the gamification piece of it. Um, I think that's a, a, a huge value proposition for something like this to exist. Um, can you describe again just the kind of the inputs that you're measuring? So, like, if you're integrated with Asana or Trello, are you just measuring the number of t tasks that are t uh, checked off? Is that and is that what leads to determining how productive someone is? Okay, that's a great question because, of course, there are some tasks tasks that are going to be way bigger than other tasks, and if you have an employer that's completing twenty. Um, small tasks a day, you can't compare that to somebody who finished a project that takes a month to complete. So what, what we focus, as, something we really focus at, at attraction, is the ability to have a lot of customization in terms of the points of each goal, for example, uh, how much weight each, each achievement or each, each goal completed should have. And this is something that each project manager and each um, employer or boss would have access and would have control over. Who sets the, the points? Do the employees have to set the points? Is that a manager that's setting up points? Um, these, these points would be set specifically by each project management, uh, project manager or, or team leader for each of the, uh, for each team under a company or for each company. Okay. And this is something that would depend on the um, weight of the task at hand, and it will be at the discretion of at the discretion of each each team leader. Is your MVP built? We have the designs built and the ideas. We still haven't got to the point of testing an actual prototype, but we we aim to. Yeah, great, looks great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, again. Um... Thanks for the feedback. Uh, let's see if we have one from uh, YouTube real quick for you. Um, I'll just say this. I mean, it, you kind of answered around it, um, but how do you track, uh, this is from Bill. How do you actually track true productive work time? So is it up to the employee to start the timer process? I know you talked about that with the manager or, um, you know, what if employees start manipulating it or kind of gamifying the their own playing their own game to kind of uh, get more rewards. Uh, how do you stop that? Right. Yeah, so what traction measures, we can break it down into two parts. One part would be distractions. It would be like time spent on social media, time spent checking your personal email. That would be one aspect of, of traction, and that would be something that traction would also send you recommended goals. For example, we saw that last week you used um, social media for 50 minutes every day. Can you get that down to 40 minutes for this week? That would be an example of getting of traction using machine learning to get you to decrease your distractions. On the other hand, we have the engagement part, which is those competitions with other coworkers. And that has also to do with distraction, but it has more to do with the task completions. And of course, that would be said by each team leader and each project manager, which on, on the one hand, that cannot be manipulated by each employer, by, by each employee. And on the distraction level, if you want to um, spend twice your time on, on, on social media or distracting websites, you can do that, but that would affect you. The only way to manipulate that, that aspect would be to decrease your distractions. All right. Great answers. Okay, so now we're at the point in the, uh, the pitch competition to where the judges will step out. They'll actually join a Zoom breakout room. Um, and then everybody will hang out for a bit in the main um, lobby. Um, but in between then, we have about 10 minutes. So we're going to show a video um, that TechSquare ATL uh, made of uh, one of this season or one of the, this quarter's, um, anyways, one of the startup exchanges, many events that they had uh, pre-coronavirus. Uh, so check that out. And that will shortly be followed by a uh, membership 
uh, pitch telling you all about what Startup Exchange is. So we'll go ahead and watch that. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Santosh Saravanan, and I am the current director of the membership program here at Startup Exchange. I am happy to represent my membership exec team, Ravon, Gabe, and Saurav, as well as the rest of the executive team here at Startup Exchange Georgia Tech. Today, I'll be talking about the membership program, what we do, and some of our events. We will also be opening up our applications for next fall at the end of this presentation. So if any of you guys are interested, make sure to go ahead and fill out your credentials in that application just so we can look through them and get to know you better. Other than that, let's get into the presentation. In its whole, the membership program was designed to provide students at Georgia Tech with the opportunity to experience the startup scene at a more exclusive level. As seen here, we focus on several aspects of the startup space and attempt to provide our members resources in a creative manner. We provide students the low risk, high reward opportunity to experience the startup space. And we do this by exposing them to events like our pitch competition, where they can pitch an idea to gain feedback from prominent individuals in Atlanta's startup community. We also facilitate their learning in the initial stages of a startup. Through our research and education, our members learn about the process of customer discovery, market research, and product iteration. Another aspect of the program is to provide students with connections to impactful individuals within Atlanta's startup space. In the past, we've had membership programs actually go on to help founders of startups in the Atlanta community with some of their projects and actually intern for them and gain that experience. Here we have our fall 2019 membership program. Now as an exec member, I'm very proud of this program. This class included students from different backgrounds and majors. And as a program, we really worked on bringing in diverse opinions and creating business ideas from them. This class actually had three membership groups who ended up winning awards in our pitch competition while competing against other non-membership Georgia Tech student-led teams. So this was tough crowd and our membership teams actually came out on first, second, and third place, which we here at Startup Exchange are very proud of. Now, when looking for members, we are not looking for any particular experience in anyone. As a program, we love students who are curious, passionate learners, self-starters, student leaders, and creative in thought. And we, in general, are hoping to bring in a diverse group of members for our fall 2020 semester. People from different backgrounds, majors, cultures. We believe that this diversity is going to help our creativity and in helping in that can create better ideas for the future. As a whole, Startup Exchange membership, we really focus on providing certain benefits to our members in the program. We hope they gain hands-on experience alongside like-minded peers internship and workout opportunities, as well as exclusive men mentorship from our leadership network here at Startup Exchange. We also believe they can learn from question and answer sessions with Atlanta entrepreneurs, ideation challenges, as well as, as, well as skills workshops, and more like our pitch competition. But most importantly, we want our members to form a tight-knit community and friendships with our fellow members. We believe that at the end of the day, Forming meaningful relationships with your members within the membership program is going to be very important to creating further business ideas down the line. And we want to foster that and we want to be the home of those relationships here at Startup Exchange Membership Program. Now, in the past, clients who have come in to talk to our membership program have been startups who have been interested and self-interested to come talk to us. We've had a range of industries represent from software to hardware to aerospace companies, and really continue to bring in exciting startups to interact with our members. As you can see on this list, at the top left, we have Human Capital, a student-run venture capital firm who actually came in and provided exclusive mentorship to some of our members in a private dinner. 
We've also had software companies like Nightly and 2K and AI come in to talk about their startup experience and their entire journey and provide that advice to our members. We've also had Presso, a company working on instant dry cleaning to talk about their insights in the startup space, customer discovery, and market research. And the same goes for Hermius, an aerospace company which is up and coming right now, allowing our students to intern and provide them with those opportunities to really work for an up and coming startup. In general, some of our events at startup companies follow a general scope. We really focus on anything on the right side of the screen, anything really from the startup process to talking about specific concepts with entrepreneurship, maybe customer discovery, uh, market research, and then also allowing the startup to recruit our members if they're interested. Our events are very dynamic and can really be tailored in any sort of fashion, but we generally want to suit the interests of our members and allow them to choose what type of events they want. So this program is suited completely for them and tailored for their interests. Now to move on to the pitch competition like the one today, it's really designed to provide membership teams the opportunity to showcase their semester long idea. Teams really have the ability to interact with potential funders and receive feedback on their pitch. In the past, our pitch competition last fall was our first one and we believe it was extremely successful and we really hope to continue this tradition for semesters to come. We believe that the one today is gonna have a lasting impact on our membership teams and is really gonna generate interest from new members coming in as well. Here's just some highlights from our last pitch competition last semester. Like I said before, we as a community at Startup Exchange and specifically the membership program are very proud to say that our three membership teams won first, second, and third place respectively. They were competing against other student-led Georgia Tech teams who are not part of the membership program specifically. And our teams actually were able to come out on top regardless. So we believe that our mentorship, our events, our networking events with startups and that experience that our members are gaining is actually helping them. And we believe that the pitch competition is an indicator of that. And we really want to show the success for the long term. Um, in general, um, at my ideas as an exec member, I really think the membership program can be built and developed to something that is really a hub for students who want to gain experience in a really low risk way. And we believe that we're building that here. So we're excited to continue and move this tradition forward. Um, just to show you guys some metrics of growth, as a whole, the membership program has been growing rapidly. In one semester, we have seen significant increases in both our application rates and participation rates. And we hope to bring more value to our members as we continue the membership program. We're very excited for, the for what the future holds and we really wanna see where we can take the membership program for semesters to come. Generating new ideas is what we're working on currently, and we hope to bring more value to our members um, prior, past just the pitch competition, to actually provide them with further resources to actually help build their startup from start to finish. Now, this comes to the end of the presentation. Um, if any of you guys are interested in being part of the fall 2020 membership class, our applications are currently open. All you need to do is follow this link or QR code and fill out the application. And in general, we are excited to get to know each and every one of you. And as an exec member and me talking on behalf of my other members, we hope to see um, any of you guys who are interested in the startup space who really don't want to get too involved, but really want the introductory, introductory um, experience. The membership program is perfect for you. We allow you with the opportunity to start an idea with a group of members in a low risk, high reward way and you'll be able to pitch your idea at the pitch competition at the end, um, allowing for you the opportunity to mentor, get mentorship services, as well as connect with uh, VCs, win cash and prize money, um, as well as much more. So the membership program is growing and it's growing fast, and we hope that you're part of this growth in the future. Um, and we hope to, hope to see you guys there for next fall 2020. If you're interested, once again, please apply to this um, using the QR code. We will keep this up for a few minutes. Um, but other than that, Thank you guys so much for um, listening to this presentation and um, let's go on with the pitch competition and see who ends up winning. Thank you.
Welcome back. Um, seems as though uh, judges are done. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, and uh, seems like it was a little tough to decide. I know it was for me. I couldn't even vote. So sorry about that. But uh, thanks again, everybody, from um, on behalf of TechSquare ATL. Uh, thank you for watching the live stream, and we'll pass it on over to Stevan for the results. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in on behalf of Starb Exchange and TechSquare ATL. Um, we had some great pitches today and thank you for all the teams for pitching. Thanks again to all the judges as well, as well as the sponsors and the teams. We're excited to um, announce the winners of the People's Choice Awards in first place and second place. Um, I was just with the judges and it was quite, um, it was quite difficult choosing who would be the winner. Um, so without further ado, I will announce the People's Choice Award um, with the voting on the Starb Exchange website goes to fast pass oh no it didn't work <laughs> now oh go ahead now let's move on to second place um so actually choosing between the six teams for the judges was quite difficult um it took us about 15 minutes it took uh, quite a few conversations and now i will announce the second place winner congratulations to jim splat So Jim Splat will be receiving $250 and FastPath will be receiving $100 for the People's Choice Award. And now without further ado, the first place $500 prize as decided by the judges goes to Slate. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you again to all of the teams that pitched today. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it as well as thank you to the audience. Um, just want to give a little bit of a reminder. So Starp Exchange is hosting a virtual event this upcoming Wednesday at 4 p.m. with Sue Harnett. She is a tech entrepreneur and the founder of Rewriting the Code. Rewriting the Code partners with universities and tech companies to place college women in technology into technical internships. She'll be speaking on how to make a real impact with your startup. This is Wednesday at 4 p.m. and you can sign up on our website, startup.exchange. Again, everyone stay safe and healthy and thanks for tuning in. We'll now go to our judges for them to have a bit of a closing statements and a little bit of feedback for all the teams. Hey guys, first of all, fantastic job pitching. It is really hard to pitch in front of a screen without other people in front of you, without feeling the energy from the crowd and to be able to organize your pitches and your videos. And you guys did a fantastic job. Uh, just because you weren't selected as one of the winners doesn't mean you should stop doing what you're doing. Entrepreneurship is hard. This stuff takes time. And it's really difficult. And the fact that you showed up here and pitched was the first step in that journey that you're going towards. Sorry, my cat just fell off a table. Sorry, <laughs> got super distracted. <laughs> um, anyways, just want to say I really enjoyed hearing your pitches and appreciate you having me be part of this. Um, if everyone wants to get in contact with me, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Always open to chatting with people and keep pushing hard on your startups and look forward to meeting you guys in person after coronavirus. Thanks. Hey everyone, um, I'll be quick. I just am super honored to be here with you. You all are so brilliant and have thought through this problem and the different layers of how to bring your company out. It's, it's just amazing to watch and I'm learning so much from you. So thank you so much. And your pitches were awesome, um, really powerful. Uh, so congratulations on your hard work it shows and um i will piggyback on what seth said if just because you didn't get selected trust me it was a really hard decision you are all amazing so um there's a reason you're here and stay on the journey this is about persistence um and uh again also as uh, i like seth i would be happy to connect with you on linkedin uh so look up blanca catalina garcia and i hope to connect with you soon and congratulations to all of you yeah. Definitely echo those sentiments. Congratulations to all of you. All of you should be proud of what you're doing and um, feel good about your en uh, your entry into the uh, into the competition. It was a hard choice um, all around. Um, you know, it's always the challenge of comparing apples and oranges. Uh, that's there. I think you know all of you. Um, you know, I have the. The, the fortunate job of working with all the student entrepreneurs that are going through campus. And I absolutely encourage all of you to come talk to me as you're looking and thinking about your ideas. 
um, like I said, I have a great job to be able to meet with you and, and try to help you as much as I can to, to build your business. Um, uh, if you didn't win, you should not be discouraged at all. It's, um, you know, there's so much that, um, uh, so much potential for all of these opportunities and you're gonna learn and pivot in the process. Uh, just going through it, you know, the, the, the best thing you're gonna get out of it is that entrepreneurial bug, which is really hard to shake once you get it and just absolutely encourage that whole um, culture that we're seeing on campus. Um, as an alumni, I wish it was there when I was going through school uh, and to be around all the, all the different support mechanisms. So congrats to everyone. Um, apply to Startup Launch uh, next year. Um, and we're uh, looking forward to you know, seeing how you guys develop and build your progress. So congrats. Great, thank you judges. And thank you TechSquare ATL for being our partner in this. I hope everyone enjoyed the virtual pitch competition today. Um, I would like to invite everyone for, if they want to connect or sponsor our next pitch competition, feel free to reach out on our website, startup.exchange, as well as if you have any questions. Hope everyone enjoyed it and thanks for tuning in. Thanks.